evening, everyone, and good evening, Sally. Very warm welcome. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you, Mark. Are you? Pretty good, thank you. Yeah, we had um, Pete Sturge on, I think it was last week, I don't know, all the days are merging into one, um, and Pete <laughs> said that um, we had to get you on. And uh, luckily, we'd already had you booked in anyway. But um, yeah, it's great. It's great that you're you're here and it be recorded and it can go out at a later date also. But um, yeah, Sally, if you just want to start from the beginning, really. Um, oh, before you get that far, what's your current role in the game? Um, same as you, Mark. I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll need to remember to get Sturge attending next time I see you. Um, <laughs> Uh, I am at present um, and love it, uh, counter coach developer for Derbyshire. So exactly the same role as what you do uh, in your county, I do it up, at, up in Derbyshire. Yeah, um, so delivering on courses, we deliver like level ones, twos, UA for B's and support coaches for our for our counties. Um, but I'd be really interested to to see where you started your journey, Sal, because um, obviously I know you from our time at the FA, but I'm not sure sort of prior to that what, what you were doing, how your journey started. Uh, coaching journey, yeah. in the sense of, uh, I were at college actually when I started coaching uh, and playing at the college and uh, part of the role um, of captain and vice captain at the time and our vice captain in my first year were to uh, help with warm-ups and just kind of help out a little bit with the coaching and the the tutor at college um, was running the girls centre of excellence down at Barnsley and it were okay. a centre of excellence at the time um, and just said actually you know you're quite uh, all right at organising the group I think you meant our boss <laughs> in the book so and uh, just said, do you want to come down to Barnsley and just help out with the girls? And that kind of started started that. It's, I used to go to uh, watch the football with my dad from being young and um, got into playing a little bit from that. And then, uh, yeah, then I just started and did my level one at college, did my level two at university and then did my UA for B the year I left university. Um, so I got into coaching quite quick and went through my awards quite quick to be honest um, and then I was really fortunate um, that I came across because I'd done my B license at the time any female got given a mentor at the FA uh, and I got given Colin Morris which is oh, Dave, hey. Dave's dad, Dave's yeah. dad uh, that obviously works with us and Colin was uh, tutoring and got me into tutoring quite early on so I was tutoring level ones um, from about age of 22, 23. Wow. So young, young and female were a different, different yeah. kettle to start with as well. Um, so yeah, got into got into coaching that way, got into tutoring that way. Um, and then we well, very fortunate when I left college, I went to work for my parents in the morning and did admin at their, their company. And then in the afternoon, I got, I did my own little coaching school doing, um, PPA after school club and then I took on the role of centre director at the academy with the girls and did loads of different coaching jobs um, as well as then tutoring for the FA and then I got a really random phone call um, to uh, ask me if I'd go down to London for a little chat um, at the David Beckham Academy so I went down to London um, I went down there as a coach educator so my team, or not my team, but in our little group, was uh, Paul Alder, Ted Dale, yeah. Ted yeah, Payne yeah. and me. Oh, so that was a coach yeah. group down there. Um, so yeah, we're there and then left there um, and came to the FA full time to join the skills programme. Around about, I think about 2007, something like that, I think, uh, skills programme. Um, and we're part of the skills programme all the way up to then... Um, becoming a CCD so yeah but I absolutely love the skills program we're in there probably about 10 years and then obviously a CCD will up and we'll be yeah. able to move into that one um yeah I've mentioned about the skills program on here many times but you know I was coaching probably 20 years prior to the sort of skills job um yeah. but that really just opened my mind and like from there I, I I kind of realised what coaching was about then, and we'll, we'll come on to that with, with you. But yeah. It was a real sort of all-encompassing. You know, if you think about the four corners, I was just 
um, sort of prior to that role, heavily focused in the technical corner. But um, it just really opened my eyes up with um, with behaviour management and the whole sort of plethora of things, really. But um, before we move on to that um, juicy stuff, who who was your sort of first inspiration as a coach? Uh, who inspired you to coach? Uh, to coach? Um, as I said, probably my, my tutor at college probably got me into coaching and and got me given the the role. My dad really pushed me, my dad really not pushed me, into it, but pushed me um, and helped and guided me in my coaching. Um, it, it was kind of something I fell into, if I'm being honest. I didn't like mm. have this person that I thought I want to be them or really yeah. inspired me to do it. It was just uh, it just set, seemed to happen organically. And then, and then realistically later on in life, or in my coaching journey later on, then there were a few people that then ins have inspired me. But it's not really been until I've got in the last latter few years that's really I've had about four people in that time that's really inspired me. That's interesting, actually. Yeah, because it's um, I, I ask this question quite a lot, and it's like the conventional answer is that you know a big name or, or your, your first coach or whatever it is. But like you say, it's someone more recently, which is which is fab. Um, so we've got we've got a list of sort of generic questions that we normally ask. But I've been I've been lucky enough to be in on a couple of meetings with you you recently um, with Simon Millington also, um, and we've really down delved into stuff around um, social engagement systems and this polyvagal theory and I've got to be honest that the, the two days after we met I don't think <laughs> I slept my head was just banging from side to side in a good way I have to say um, you know I've been looking up you said about the Philippa Perry book um, a book that you wish your, your parents had, uh, yeah. had read um, and I've done a lot of research myself into it and it just makes perfect sense to me um, yeah. And I just would love you just to to touch on that kind of stuff for me. Oh God! I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where you'd start with it, but um, yeah. I mean, if I if I whilst you're thinking whilst you're whilst you're thinking, Sally, you sent a couple of videos over, and hopefully um, I can get them across to Rich, and if it's okay by you, we can we can share them maybe on the website. Yeah. There's one in particular that I watched because I do do my research. Um, and there was a there was a player that um, was struck on the nose with oh, the football, yeah. as you all remember. Um, and it's happened to us. All the coaches on here now would have happened, you know, a million times. But the way you dealt with it was fantastic and probably different than I thought you were going to deal with it. Um, so yeah, maybe explain that, and then maybe that will flow nicely into the polyvagal yeah. theory. All right. Well, I'll start a little bit within how I've kind of gone down this route, shall I? Yeah. In yeah. a sense of, I was quite fortunate that I were on the pick for the pilot of the Advanced Youth Award. So that happened in uh, 2012. And on that, I got exposed to the psych and social corner. Like you said, Mark, you know, until we got in the skills programme, really, it, it was an element that wasn't very at the forefront of people's minds. And so I went, I were fortunate, like I said, to the AYA. And I went back and were well, delivering in the skills program. And the, it just seemed to be working with the kids and I were loving it. And it, they just seemed to be growing in front of my eyes. In, is in children and is in is in players. And um, and I ended up going on a, 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 a kind of a journey myself with it. And I, and I wanted to know more. I wanted to know how by doing a certain thing with children, in or creating this certain environment that got brought out in the youth awards and in the AYA, how does it give you what it's giving you? I wanted to really know the how and the why and below the surface. And I was really fortunate that a couple of my best friends um, work at an approach called the Thrive Approach. And they go in to help support um, teachers or practitioners in a, in a school setting to really understand around child development, attachment theory, neuroscience, and apply it into helping children that are struggling with their emotional social development in an element of struggling to even get through the door to actually, you know what, they're just going through a little bit of a rough time, like probably a lot of children are at the minute. So how can we just help and support them? So what's kind of where we should be within children, which you've referred to about some of the books and things that I've given mm. to you. 
the major thing for me was around language and understanding that behaviours that some that um, drive people um, and children are a product of what is in our brain systems from evolution. And sometimes that are, are helpful ways and they're unhelpful ways, but they're there to keep us safe. Mm. And when they kind of kick in, they take over our, our human part of our brain and our thinking capacity and just keep us safe. And we go into kind of a fight, flight or freeze structure. And so within that situation, um, and we want, me and Sturge were filming actually for some videos for the 5-11s vote room, and it happened. That wasn't staged, but I just went in and did it, and it was luckily that we were having it filmed for the, yeah. the session. Um, and I went into the child, and, you know, he's been hit on his nose. He doesn't really know me. He's getting filmed. Um, and in Nerval, for me, and he were a goalkeeper, which is even, you know, isolated, for me to be able for him, he were crying because he'd been nothing in his nose. Um, and for me, that's a response that means that he's out of his thinking capacity and that he's just surviving by an outward behaviour. And I need to help him with that. Instead of me saying, um, come on, you're all right, stop crying. You know what? He's not. And we wouldn't be if we got probably whacked in the face or we got yeah. kicked in the leg. But if you put it in an adult context, just by saying, oh, come on, it's all right, the language doesn't hit the part of the brain that helps us to be able to self to help in a correlational approach to calm him down, to help him get back into his thinking capacity. And, and the language that you use and the way that you approach it with your face and your tone helps children or adults to get out of their, and there's three systems, get out of life threat or danger, to be able to then get the child back into their social engagement system, which obviously you've referenced. So feeling okay, back into all three parts of their brain and ready to then be back up for relationships, back up for making decisions, problem solving, which we need in football and as a goalkeeper within yeah. any position. Um, so my relationship of me going in and validating the tuning, even though I think, oh, oh I, I am not sensing it, I need to validate and tune to his feelings of emotions and his bodily responses to help support him. So then he knows that if any time he's hurt, I'm going to come and help him. But also I'm going to then, by the, all the behaviours and the, all the science that goes below the surface then between me and him in a correlational approach, I can help to then bring him back into the present. And I think as a coach, we need to realise that our language and how we are um, when children are in their life threat or danger, in which is fight, flight or freeze, and there's certain behaviours that come out in that, we really need to be curious and recognise those behaviours and be in their relationship with them to help support them so then they're back in their thinking capacity, which then they can make good decisions, they can problem solve, they can reflect, they can plan, uh, and they can say sorry. Because sometimes when we say to children, go say sorry, and you get a sorry, that's because they're not in all three parts of their brain. So... That's kind of a, a, a backdrop of, of that. And then there was some safe touch, there was some modelling, um, but it very much were about attunement, validation, facial expression, tone of voice, um, language that I use, um, a little bit of safe touch and a bit of modelling. So, yeah. <clears throat> oh, that's brilliant, Sally. And um, <laughs> do, do, yeah, it's excellent. And um, I, I love it. And it struck a chord with me because I, I remember saying to you, I just related it to maybe me being at school, uh, maybe a, um, a teacher just pointing at me, you know, you give me the answer. Um, and then I'd be no good to anyone because I'd be in uh, fight mode probably or freeze mode um, and you wouldn't get anything out of me. But there'd be other people in my little group, that little cluster at school that would have been in that social engagement system um, and would have thrived in it. So yeah. does that boil down to then um, knowing these players as people before players, um, knowing a bit more about their social engagement systems, knowing a bit more about them? Um, there's probably twofold to it. Knowing more about them and recognising and shining a light on some of the behaviours and noticing them and being curious about them. So um, she's like this when, but she's not like this when. 
So what's the difference? Why, why is she like it in certain situations, not others? Or if there's been a change in behaviour, might be then uh, understanding about the curious bit about, oh, is that a change in behaviour? There's also an element of we can create an environment that enables or should hopefully help to provide children with the best possible start to a session that hopefully will be the majority of children will be in their social engagement system. And children like containment, they like structure, but they don't like structure in the sense of this is how it's got to be, but they like the structure in containment to make them feel safe. And once they feel safe and we are um, in our social engagement system, we can be up for relationships, we can give eye contact, we can, when you ask a question around um, what do you think about this session or how can we maybe, what would you, uh, about a different pass or a different option and you don't get anything back, the ones that normally do give you it back and they give you eye contact, they're putting their hands up, that's because they're in their social engagement system. So we can do a couple of things and that's where that I talk around is one around personal greetings. So with children, noticing uh, something about them, giving them a name and a personal greeting is massive. Um, structure boards. So when children come into your session, you know, just on your whiteboard, it might be seven o'clock, till 10 past arrival, 10 past while half past um, um, skills corridor, half past while eight, a game. So children that need some structure, um, some children will come in and check the whiteboard for structure, some people, some children won't. But you're creating that element of containment for them. And then an arrival activity, research shows there's 10, 15 minutes on arrival, increases learning because it gives them, we've got a play circuit in our brain, and when, we give them the, when we've got an innate urge to play or they've had wet play and we give them that opportunity to play, it opens up the thinking capacity, lowers behaviour because they're in social engagement and, and it gives us chance to be able to set up, gives the kids the chance to be able to play and, like I said, it's innate in their, in their play circuit. And also it gives us a chance to sense in because we're probably normally rushing from work and somebody's coming off and we're trying to get set up and then they've got parents but for us to be in the moment with the children which I've just explained earlier with that element of um, when they, he got hit on the nose and we were validating and tuning and in, in, in relationship we've got to be in our social engagement system because if we're not in our social engagement system we can't notice when the children are in there because our think capacity is off we're just surviving in the session yeah. And so when we're not recognising things and we're just surviving and we're not going, what's wrong? We're just going through the motions. Then we can't be in relationship with that child and help them to support them while they're having the struggles and the challenges in the session. So yeah. there's three little things for me around personal greeting, structure bar and arrival activities. Yeah, I think that's interesting. You said about us being on our social engagement system. I'm sure there's many coaches on here that can sort of resonate with that in terms of surviving in the session as you said you know yeah. with the, the external factors of parents around you know most of the coaches on here i'm guessing are um you know are working full-time and they're fantastic volunteers that have to put a session together go and deliver that session we're in the middle and we're surviving in the session so how yeah. do i then be able to it's it, it, it's incredible um i love the stuff around like personalizing the names i draw back to time um, I was refereed by a, a famous referee called Brian Hill, who refereed in a cup final, um, who didn't he didn't know me at all, but who had researched the program prior to the game and yeah. matched up the name to the to the number. Um, yeah. and, and I remember going in for a 50-50 with someone and uh, sort of remonstrating with the player like you do when you get up. And he just said to me, Mark, just calm down. Um, it's a free kick to the other team, that's it, in a nice way. Yeah. And I just melted because he made it personal, yeah. um, which just adds so much power. And I've tried to take that on, as I know you're big on it, Sally. With um, you know, when, when we're when we're delivering courses and things like that, but when we're delivering coaching sessions, I think to me it is hugely important. But yeah, I'd like you just maybe if you could do to maybe elaborate on that. And you know, the stuff you've done around personal greetings. I think you've done yeah. some maybe some research as part of your your masters on it. But um, I'd love you to delve into that for us. 
So within the name stuff, which I this is what I try to put it into a different context all the time. So and try to put it in an adult context. So if you think around as a parent, how long you probably took to a, agree a name for your children, it's a long process. It's a and it's something that you go back and forth with. So a name is an important thing to somebody. Um, it also gives them a sense of identity, which hits certain parts of their limbic system in their brain. And um, it also, if you think around, if you've at work done some really good piece of work or you get an email from somebody and they've spelt your name wrong, straight away you're like, it, 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 it irates you. So we've got to think around, if we put things in adult context into the kids, we sometimes expect kids to just go with it when actually it's totally different when you start looking about the names and it hits like i said certain parts in the in the care yeah. system my thing around personal greetings is um and i've looked at it from a couple of lenses is personal greetings in education there's massive research that shows that it by a personal greeting you are hitting certain parts of the brain you are building up relational approach and the fundamental things for social and emotional development and for learning is based on a correlational approach and the, if you can greet children when they're coming into their session on a personal greeting then it increases um their learning capacity and their their on task behavior and decreases their off task behavior which helps us as coaches and it also helps them as children and this is then linked into arrival activities and things like that in a sense of if I know when we go back after COVID, people are going to be thinking we've got to get these sessions done. But actually, arrival activities is one of the main things that then supports this as well. And um, there's a really good video on Edutopia called Tums, and that's around um, safe touch, personal greetings, noticing, smile. And smile on your face is what is in your threat detection system. So when you are in your social engagement system, you are now because you're nodding at me, you're giving me eye contact. When you're not, when you're done, and I've done it before, I've done a team talk at our time when we're like eight nil down. And you have, some, <laughs> like, you have some that's like this. And then you have some that is just. Mm. And absent mindedness is a clear indicator and no eye contact is a very clear indicator that they're not in their social engagement system. So a personal greeting to give them some eye contact, give it something that's personal to them. Some children do not like or do not want bodily contact. So my thing around it was around us enforcing sometimes place to shake our hands. Yeah. Um, when it's um, seen as a probably sign of respect, um, but we sometimes in certain settings or certain systems, we have the power, um, even though we, we might not think we do, but sociological, and if you look at it through an ecological lens, we do. Um, so by a personal greeting, you are sharing of power. This is particularly important with boys. Um, boys have a problem with their rupture and repairing their relationships. Um, girls and, as, uh, are easier to um, repair after they've ruptured. A healthy relationship will rupture and repair on a constant basis. But how you rupture and repair, we had the conversation, didn't we, the other day? How you yeah. rupture and repair is a massive thing. Boys, from a sociological perspective and how they are brought up through stereotypes, struggle to come back into repairing. So a personal greeting shares power and enables them to start to build some of this relational approach that they may need to come to then speak to around certain situations or be open and honest more about feelings or us to have them some hard, difficult conversations as well. So personal yeah. greetings for me is something that um, I think if you could get to a point where every child has their own personal greeting, I've got yeah. a nephew and two nieces, and I have a personal greeting with all three of them. My nephew's 18, my niece is 13, and my other niece is four. And even now, Jacob, if I see him with all his mates or whatever, or he's in a certain situation, we still personal greet. And he, um, all three of them love it. Because it's that yeah. personal connection, it means something, it means you care. And we've got a care system that sits in our, our limbic system that all this stuff hits and helps support. And this is all around 
developing stuff below the surface. So even we might think our oh, personal greeting, but the neuroscience and social attachment and the things that gets brought out in the research shows that this is what happens below the surface. And that's why I went and did the course that I wanted to do um, to become a practitioner in it, in it all and develop, develop it. And then I brought it back to the football because I feel sometimes we're very surface level um, we're very grass level and we need to we need to really think around how we develop the soil for our children so that they've got a really good stress response system to be able to cope with what life throws at us. We're also be able to cope with things on the grass and life. And this is some of the stuff around what I've just talked around really does help through relational approach, through the coach, through the people. But one person can have a massive, massive effect on one child's life. So people always say to me, well, it's all right me doing this as a coach. I'll see him once a week or then a game, family and, and, um, and school. Do never, ever, ever, ever underestimate the power that you can have by, by those little interactions because you can change neural development. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're so right. I, I, I remember my coach at eight or nine and um, we used to get beat 10-0, 20-0. But they were some of the best days of my life. They yeah. really were. He wasn't a coach, really. He didn't have many sort of practices in his in his locker. He was a, <laughs> he was a volunteer. He was amazing. Um, but in terms of the social side, it was it was it was brilliant. Um, and I remember doing some sort of child development stuff. At, I think when I first joined the FA, and there was a um, early years specialist. You might have been around then, so I don't know. But it was fascinating to me that she said about. Um, the difference between sort of boys and girls and um, yeah. how girls can multitask uh, better um, and she said just you know um, she, she said at the end of the day to, to the class as a whole of a group of five-year-olds I think it was um, get your bags put your chairs on the table and line up and the first three in the queue were girls yeah a few boys a few boys scratching their heads um, but you know I, I just think I just think I wanted to get you on because I just think this stuff is really really valuable and I just think I'm not expecting you know everyone to sort of digest everything that we're talking about but just be armed and equipped with just a couple of nuggets really um, which kind of leads me on to, to to things like which I know the coaches are going to experience like um, um, behavior management and things yeah. like that in um, in our sessions which is going to happen all the time and you know when you talk about social engagement systems we've all had those um, children that look like they're not engaged that are looking up in the air or looking somewhere else and we're constantly trying to get them back in that makes sense to me after what you said but how might you manage a situation like that Sally? Um, so just just to recap before I go back onto that is yeah. boys wise yeah. it fascinates me um, and I as you are aware I, I don't I don't really work in the women's game. I very much work boys' side. Um, and there's a book called How to Raise Boys, Emotionally Boys, and it's called it's by Michael Reichart. And it's one of the best reads I've had in a long time. And if you think around, and it, what Pippa Yulden you're talking around, around the specialists that came in, um, oh, yeah. if you think around with boys and girls, even in the womb, we dis we go against it. So I've just been my friend's birthing partner and um, started having problems in, in labour and the two midwives come in and were like, typical boy, typical boy, causing problems already. And from even in the womb, we are drawing on experiences. So when you are conceived, there's a hippocampus, like it's called, oh, it's hippocampus, but it's like a tape recorder that gets switched on your brain and you're drawing in experiences. And you even have to walk around, you know, Tesco or Primark or whatever, and you've got Daddy's Little Monster, Mummy's Little Princess. And we are programmed in sociologically to it all. There is no real structure differences. I've been on a webinar today with the, one of the leading professors in neuroscience. There's no structural differences in boys' and girls' brains. But what we, how we are with them and how we perceive boys to be as infiltrated and this is not my word, this, that's the, from the book, around how we coach boys in the playing fields and how we coach boys in the, in the classroom. And mm -hmm. my nephew went to an all-boys school and you had to drop him off at the gate and walk in and my mum's going, grandma's going, well, I think that's ridiculous. And I'm going, well, have you looked around the classroom? 
in when it's a mix. You know, boys will be, not saying everybody, but normally you will see that girls will go in, put the coat on, get the bags out, go into the classroom, whereas boys probably, mums or dads taking them in, sorting them out. And <laughs> it's there's no differences in brain or structure. Um, but it's where we actually, and boys are very much in their present, in their emotions and feelings up to the age of six. At the age of six, they start to become more aware of what boys should be like. Mm. So they become then sometimes disassociated from this process. Um, but m being aware of emotions and feelings and boys and girls is it's, it's what's kind of infiltrated us. Um, yeah. So that's the first one around boys because it's something that I'm really passionate about. Just, um, just, I'll, I'll just sorry. No, that's brilliant. And just interject there before you carry on, Sally. I wonder then, you know, we're 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 in the midst now of um, Mental Health Awareness Week, which is something that I'm, and I know you are as well, hugely passionate about. And I just wonder then, you start looking at the 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 stats for sort of suicide in 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 men, which yeah. are higher than in women. And then if you look back to maybe some of the language that's used early on, certainly when I was growing yeah. up, of boys don't cry, and then you yeah. get into the man up culture. Um, it's easy to see where it where it kind of starts, I suppose. Yeah, and a lot of said to me, um, different coaching girls to boys, but girls are more mature. Um, we're all the product of what the environment that we put in and how we get modelled and what experiences we see. So my reflection back would be is, are they, as children, or are we? So I, I, I look at ourselves in the sense of, do we treat them differently because of boys and girls? Um, and what we are perceived to believe or what we are exposed to in society. And and that's a big thing for me because there isn't, every, every child is totally different, whether it's boy, girl, they're all at different rates, but you are born with certain genetics and then how then you are exposed and your experiences then shapes where you will build up some of your characteristics, which we've talked around sometimes when children are in these particular states, like you've just mentioned about behaviour management, when they're looking all around them all the time, sometimes we'll go, oh, that child is this. So that child, tell you what, never concentrates in sessions, never concentrates in sessions, don't want to be here. But actually, if you think around what some of them states are in social engagement states, danger state, life threat state, probably quite a lot in a life threat state, which sounds harsh, but it's not the terminology that you think life's a threat, but absent-mindedness and not concentrating is not only social engagement system or she's not. So we need to start to understand and help that child. It's not the child, it's the state that's becoming a trait. And sometimes then our view of that child becomes quite limited in is this or is that? And, it's prob and that isn't, because that state is something that that child hasn't got below the surface. So we yeah. need to really help them with that. But the fact that we need to develop their stress response system so then they are in their social engagement system a lot more. So yeah. behaviour management wise, I would say, be very curious about behaviours and separate the child from the behaviour. What's the behaviour telling you? And how we approach it and how we are in tune with them and what language we use um, is massive. And we can have a massive effect in changing that. Um, and even if we have children that come to our sessions that are up for relationships and cope with things, um, ones that put their hand up, ones that ask to do things, they've still got um, an element of all this to tune and validate to them to strengthen actually what's below the surface. So behaviour management wise, I think we do a lot of top down behaviour stuff, which is choice behaviour. I think for behaviour management, this understanding social engagement system, which is a polyvagal theory, and understanding how the brain structure is um, and how the two operate together is bottom up um, in a model. And that's behaviour management. That's yeah. understanding and having an intervention um, and creating an environment that we can help children to um, have, the, have the coping mechanisms and equip them with things to be able to cope with life. Yeah. I think I've gone around the houses a little bit with that. Uh, absolutely brilliant. And um, on a, I was on a call today and someone mentioned about um, if your 10-year-old needs a pair of shoes, you might have heard this, Sally. Um, if your 10-year-old needs a pair of shoes, you wouldn't go in and ask the staff for shoes for a 10-year-old. Yeah. If that makes sense. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, we're all completely different. And just circling back to, you said probably about 15 minutes ago now, something around structure. Me yeah. personally, I would, I would definitely need structure. And some of the best courses I've been on are the ones that are structured. I personally can see, and it's timetabled. Um, I remember doing a, um, a management course some years ago now, but it was up on the board and everything was in 50 minute chunks. So me as a sort of uh, kinesthetic learner, if you like a bit of a fidgeter, I'd be looking at, ah, I just need to focus for another 10 minutes and I can go and grab a coffee. This suits me. This is absolutely brilliant. But it was there. There was no surprises. There was nothing going to jump out at me um, and, and surprise me. Um, yeah. So I want, to, I want to see, Sally, if you're in your social engagement system, I just want to test it because I've just got three scenarios that I think you'd be brilliant at answering. But do you, do you want to have a go at them? I will try. Definitely. OK, right. Scenario one, and this is I'm sure every coach on this call has experienced this. So um, you've got the group in. You're discussing the next uh, practice, let's say. And little Johnny or Sarah is constantly bouncing that football. Yeah. Um, so I've been in that situation as a as a as a player many years ago, and the coach would have kind of screamed at me, pointed at me, and told me to stop bouncing it, or even sent me around the pitch five times or to do yeah. some press ups. How might how might you deal with that, Sally? Um, I wouldn't deal with it in a sense of I will give you a I would deal with it, but I would give you a first bit of it, which is don't really make sense what I just said, but I'll explain. Um. <laughs> Children like to have boundaries. Adults like to have boundaries. You'll have unwritten rules in your house. And I was on the phone to Tony Mack earlier, actually, about a little bit about this. Um, so my thing would be is when children come to your session, and this is what sometimes causes problems when you coach your own child, um, is we need to have some boundaries. So our, my rights in my session is safety, learning, respect, which is on the playmaker and is on the AYA and it's from the social corner with Merv Roberts' stuff and so every child that comes into my session I have a clear element that everybody child has a right to be safe, a right to learn and a right to have respect so if that child was bouncing it and it was interfering with the learning element of the other group I'd say Mark do you know when you bounce that ball is that linking to our rights? No. Okay, so what are you going to do about it? I'll stop bouncing it. Thank you ever so much. So mm. if you've not got nothing in place that you can then go back onto, then that child might not think that that's doing anything wrong. And that child might need to do that for their learning. So you go, well, is that interfering? Yeah, it is. Okay, can you think of something else that doesn't interfere with learning if you need to mess with that ball? I'll do it this way. Okay. Because you made a great point about fidgeting. And structure. Um, so some children need structure to know what's coming next. So when you say oh, we're playing next weekend, what we're we doing tonight. So when they come in to the session, they go, what we're we doing tonight, we're we playing at the weekend. Structure board helps to alleviate that. You knowing what's coming in the day helps you to be calm yeah. to be for your learning because you'll be worried about what's coming next. So learning will be limited. And when you fidget, that's sometimes a need to actually, um, you've got a sensory um, and not saying every children is like this because you've got to have an understanding that one thing with one child might not be the same with other, but you've got to be curious about behaviours, is when they are fidgety, sometimes their stress response system is underdeveloped. So their way of keeping themselves regulated to try to keep in the group will be to fidget. Same as we have, at pl we have players at, 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 in our sessions that mess with the bibs, mess with the, with the sharks, What's tied the shoelaces? It's their way of their brain keeping themselves safe to try to keep them regulated. It's their body's way of going, actually, this is my experience and this is how it keeps me safe. Once we sometimes stop that, we need to start to recognise that and help and support them by doing the lo loads of correlational stuff to help to put some stuff, and I know you use it about a container, that's below the surface, so then develops their stress response system, then they can stay in the group in their social engagement system longer. Mm. Well, fascinating. Um, so I suppose the other two that I've got will probably probably link in to that, yep. you know, having a point of reference or stuff, but it's, um, but the next one was always last to come in. So, you know, when you, you, you get in the group and you're getting down yep. to their level, 
and there's one that's always last to get in and then the last one was I'm constantly talking when you're talking so you're talking as the coach but I'm whispering to the person next to me um okay so a couple of things um and um, I feel like some behaviors that we probably frame as attention seeking isn't mm. so yeah. Some of the behaviours that sometimes children display is their unhealthy way of trying to get in relationship with us. So they can't just say, do you know what, you've not noticed me tonight. They will mm. stay back because that's their way of then then getting, getting some connection with you. So, so all the behaviours that they have, some are helpful and healthy ways, some are unhealthy and unhealthy ways. And it's about trying to be in, in connection. So are you, are you noticing me? Am I, am I tuning to me? Are you validating me? Are you going to keep me safe? So a lot of a lot of um, children's behaviours is a driver for what's going below the surface. Mm. And if if you then it starts a recurring thing, I start to then go, um, Mark, you know what I've noticed is when I ask everybody to come in, the last one to come in, and um, I've noticed this and I need to help you with it. Or go down the other line of, of notice the thank you for coming in and display the yeah. baby so you're having that connection. And if you have more connection with them and build more relationships and some of the stuff with what we said about structure boards and personal greetings and arrival activities and then being in the present with them, um, I feel from coaching it and applying this on a regular basis, you kind of baseline all those little behaviours because you're meeting their needs you're in the moment with them you're present with them so they're in tune with you they're in the session they're in the flow um and you made a good point and i forgot what you said before about point of reference yeah so a point of reference that we all need to have some certainty if we have uncertainty then we struggle with it mm. so a point of reference on boundaries or what things are coming next gives us a sense of certainty um so yeah and that's one of the problems we have sometimes when you coach your own son or daughter you have certain boundaries and certainties um at in at home and then the change in football so there's a misalignment so that's why we have sometimes we have these behaviors happening because we have we've not got a consistent message and consistency and certainty is one of our needs um to feel safe and have some certainty, but then also to then throw them into certain situations that provide them with a little bit of stress and anxiety. And this is the thing, stress and anxiety is an emotion and a feeling, same as joy and love. And uh, we've got into a world now of, you know, bad and good, and it's, it's mm. not, it's emotion and feeling. And stress and anxiety in certain elements and in a certain dose can be quite a, a very positive thing. And so us being creating this environment and having a point of reference for the kids and some certainty helps to strengthen them as children and as players. Mm. That's fantastic, Sally. Yeah. Um, just the last couple for me, really, before we yeah. go to some some questions with Rich. Um, so if anybody has got any questions they want to put in the chat, now's the time to do it. We can mention you shortly. But um, yeah, how, how would you deal with the difference in sort of playing ability in a, in a session then? So those players that are sort of striving to keep up, the ones that are coping, those ones that are forging ahead and maybe having trials to get into a, uh, a local development centre or an academy. How do you how do you manage that difference? Because this is a question that comes up quite a lot on these on these sessions. Um, noticing behaviours. Yeah. Um, validating and tuning. They have exactly same principles of understanding them as children, same within technical. So they also I've found by doing some work at Boys Academy lately, before obviously we weren't allowed, um, is when you create some of these things with the kids, the levels start to change. So the ones that are struggling because of probably certain things that's going below the surface. Once you start to put some of this stuff in on a regular regular place, they actually start coming well above. 
What then sometimes happens is the ones that were strong red now are going, hey, up, what's happening here? Yeah. Bounds of language came out then, did you know? <laughs> And children will will differ all at different rates, but the more you can kind of level out these behaviours in where they're coping and thriving and where they're struggling, a lot a lot will to do will, will be to do below the surface things, because the ones that are struggling or the ones that are just coping, are just are just kind of in them in and out of them states. Where you're thriving ahead normally, sometimes will be the ones that are up for social engagement, learning, thinking. And then you've got all that, all that that comes with it. So I think, for me, I really go on of, of a, a trying to have a, a, a an impartial view of I've got eleven children or twelve children in front of me. Or every week I, I try to go it on a or in every session on that basis session to try and not go all oh, there as driver there a copa and put some fundamentals in on a regular basis and then go I've noticed this about you tonight or. Do you know what? I noticed that you found that really hard tonight. Yeah. And I'm wondering why that is. And then you can have the conversation with them. Or I've noticed that, do you know what? Your face tonight in that session was beautiful. Do you know what? The smile on your face. Did you really enjoy that session tonight? What did you know? What did you enjoy about it? Did you find it challenging? So you, it's kind of a just to being in relationship. And that's the way that I, I coach it. And I know it's different, but... I don't tend to I, I tend to look at the technical in the sense of what what situation gets out what I want to get out in a constraints based approach or with some individual challenges. But my coaching philosophy really is is more about what I put in on a regular basis with the kids and how I am with them. So my language, my baseline, that's really my coaching philosophy. I know you've not asked me that, but it, it is it is well, that's what that's why I, I, then I don't have the groups. Yeah, no, I was kind of leading into that for the last one, really, to try and underpin everything. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it's fantastic, and you know, it's great to have you on. And we've spoken to some um, current managers in the in in the football league um, who say exactly the same things. And I just think there's there's a shift or a realization now that you know, it's, if you look at the four corners, we, we we can't just focus on that red technical box all the time. There's yeah. so much more going on. Um, and you speak to academy phase leads and they say, you know, the technical box, the game is is kind of a small piece of the pie, really. It's a holistic thing. Um, so, no, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, yeah. the, the thing for me is, and it's a quote that I always use, and it's Sarah Blakemore, and she says about neuroscience is fundamental teaching and learning. And at the end, we want our players to learn the game. We want to be in a teaching mode with them. We want them to be able to plan, reflect, problem solve, decision making. They can't have that. They can't do that if they're not in their social engagement system. So yeah. for me, we've got the four corners, but there's also the, the element of the neuroscience that sits below it. So we see in the grass level, but we see the soil level. And we understand that. Yeah. I loved your, um, before we come over to Rich, I love your analogy of the bath as well, that the, the, the taps are running, which um, is the plug. <laughs> Is the plug in? <laughs> yeah. I love it. That will stay. That will stay with me. But um, uh, Rich, are you there? Is he, there. Is he falling asleep? Oh, oh no you're chance. There. Um, it's really okay. fascinating. Thanks, Sally. A um, couple of questions. Um, this one's from a bit of time ago. Robbie, good evening, Robbie. He says, uh, "Could you explain more about the skills program, please? What was it, and how did it benefit you as a coach?" Yes. Yeah, so the skills program was uh, uh, a program that actually Trevor Brookin um, put in. And, and it was a 5 to 11s program. So you, as a skills team, the original 66 of us, and we went round um, and had certain school sports partnerships that we linked in with, and we went and supported uh, primary school P te uh, teachers to deliver PE. We did some after-school clubs. We did um, skill centres where kids come and, and paid, and then we did holiday clubs. So it just all formatted around the 5 to 11 age banding. Um, and that's kind of where I did the AYA in the 5 to 11s. It enabled for me to um, be able to coach 30 odd children in a classroom with an organ in one side or a piano and a Christmas tree in the other. And <laughs> you, you just got to know the kids and it, it, it just, I just loved it. It was just a, a program that has benefited so many children. Um, it really 
paved the way on my coaching. Um, it really helped me to understand children um, and coaching, and it's a, an, an age an age of the foundation phase is just a real passion, and I think you can have so much impact at that younger age group that then impacts them later on, and and I think that program definitely did have a, have a massive impact on the, on the, on children, and probably as us as coaches as well. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I, I was so sadly you won't know, but I, I used to work for the Arm Africa Association, so I don't know if you know Ben Quelcher. Yeah, no, Ben. Yeah, I yeah. met this morning. Yeah. There you go. So um, he used to do the skills program there, and as a coach, I learned so much from him. He mentored me as well uh, during the program, so I, I've got a lot of time for the program. I know you two have uh, are the same. So uh, thanks for that. Um, yeah. Bobby also says, uh, I think this is so important to check and manage our state. If we reflect to the sessions that have gone well versus the ones that have not gone so well, it, is it the players or ourselves not managing our state that makes the biggest difference? Um, us not managing our state that makes the biggest difference because if we are not in our social engagement system that means subconsciously we are giving off players and a feeling um, and it's called neuroception so if uh, Mark and we're in my session and I'm not in my social engagement and not connecting with players it can turn the other players in their neuroception by their experience before off in the session straight away and into other states so our facial expressions, so I say I use a line quite a lot when I'm delivering around what's your, play, what's your face saying to the kids, because it's massive. So if we're in our social engagement system, your threat detection comes from your eyes down and it's a triangle and it's from when you are first born, from your caregiver coming and meeting your needs. And that's where we pick up our threat detection. Um, and so your face is key to this and your body language and a lot of the things that you're portraying in your sessions is done out of your conscious awareness through neuroception so experience that have happened before is your threat your your brain's uh, constantly on unpicking threat is this a threatful situation do i need to be on guard am i all right so if the face of yours is on threat or it's, it's similar to something in the child from experience of other things, then it's going to put them into a different state. So I would say that us being in our social engagement system, sensing in and up for relationships and having that little bit sometimes and just taking some deep breaths is really important, um, is vitally important, should I say. I would also just add a caveat onto that, that we are only human. Um, and so certain times we can't be that way, and that is, okay because we're in a world at the minute where we need to be perfect perfect children perfect parents perfect coaches perfect everything and you know what god is good enough so i would say that we need to be careful of it but we're only human as well that's a great point there thank you um elliot right. says I think this is about, you know, about uh, bouncing the ball that Mark said earlier. He says, I have a rule that I don't talk unless balls are not being touched. I sit in silence until they're ready. OK. <laughs> but, yeah, I suppose this is what it's about, and it? it's discussing it and sharing, I suppose. Um, da, 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 da. Here we go, got some questions coming. Uh, no, it was more just a statement than a question. Oh, wasn't it? OK. <laughs> I could, my I, my, my point would be on that would be... Um, would be how are you helping them to understand the lesson that they need to learn within that action? Hmm. Okay. I don't think Elliot's on the, I think he's just dropped off a short time ago. So um, we know Elliot quite well, me and Mark. So we'll, we'll uh, speak to him later. <laughs> we'll bring it up. We'll bring it up next time. <laughs> next time. Um, uh, David Summers. Good evening, David. He says, uh, what sort of things do we need to be aware of in terms of the impact of the lockdown period on the children? And how will you approach training sessions when we eventually get back? Um, okay, so massively on the lockdown is we're all probably feeling different things and we just don't know what's going to be the impact. Um, some children will be thriving in it because they're having that parent contact at home and relational approach where they might not have it as much at school because there's 32 in a class and whatever, um, but there'll still be some impact of the loss of daily life. So in our bottom of our brain we have got three circuits that really drive quite a lot of our emotions fear anger and loss and our children and us as humans now need to be a bit more kind with ourselves because 
what is probably running round round our high red and we have why we have up and down days is we've got an element we've got a loss in our brain that overrides some of our sometimes our thinking capacity so if you think around children they've lost football they've lost maybe their teacher they've lost um, their friends so their element of loss is 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 there it's a massive loss and children if we think around this is why sometimes if they lose a favorite toy or they lose a game they have an outward response but if we put it in a in a in an adult context um i we lost uh, our grandma two years ago and for the next five days me and my mom and sister stayed together so i've got the same loss circuit in my brain but just if i lose now um a book it's not the same impact as losing a family member because of my experience in life. But for children, some of it is just as in, just as, as we would if we, if we lost a family member. And some children will be going through a loss of a family member. Um, and that's why I sometimes say as well around understanding what days we play football on, like Father's Day and Mother's Day, will have a massive impact on kids. But that's another story. Um, so, but coming back to the football, going back, I always like to look the step before so Mark's mentioned it a few times about knowing what's coming. So I had a conversation with um, um, a coach the other day and the week before and then the day before we get to training, I would and I would have probably tried to keep contact as much as I can between this period. I would be saying to him, really looking forward to seeing you next Tuesday. And um, this is what we're going to do. And then on the Friday before or the Monday before the Tuesday session, I'd go, can't really wait to see you tomorrow. So you're building that transition and can connection back. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to start at six. We're going to do a arrival activity. Just to let you know, this is what we're going to do. Can't wait to see you all. And that's the way that I would definitely try to pre-give them some structure because they've, lot, they've had a lot of structure. So remember, this part of the brain is going to be then overriding it. So we're giving them some structure and some understanding and some connection before they even come back. And then as they come back in, I would definitely do all the personal reading, the connection boards, and notice and be aware of some of the language and some of the behaviours that they get brought out. And I would acknowledge that, you know what, I've, I've really missed you. And I bet this period for some of you has been really hard because I have, because I've really missed you all. And I've missed football and talk about actually the losses that they'll have because it's in, it's as a circuit in his brain and we need to recognize that mm. that's incredible thank you that's decent hope that answers your question david um matt good evening matt he says that interesting to hear sally has decided to coach predominantly in the male game was this a conscious decision or just how it ended up um two reasons why really <laughs> um one because foundation phase and i absolutely really love so my first part of my master's last year i went and did a research project and, and i coached some three-year-olds and four-year-olds for a year and um, i love the age group of from three four five six seven eight it's like that's the age group that i really love so within the boys side and um, there's there's the elements of that happening the girls side there isn't and so and the boys' academy is obviously a foundation phase, whereas the girls, there's not many that's got them in the, in under 10s. Um, when I coached in grassroots, I very much did girls to start with, and I went to boys under 13s, 14s, 15s to challenge myself. Um, so I've very much stayed boys. And also, um, a friend of mine worked in the boys' game, and who I met on my A license. And to be fair, he's kind of like gave me the confidence to be able to go into the boys' side. And I think in a way in one way i like a bit of a challenge and a change and there's not really many females working in the boys side so i think him him as a person have gave me the confidence to try and go with it but also and i like the challenge and i like what's already there in place to get my teeth into but also because the boys go from an earlier age um it's been kind of a, a nice transition in mm, enjoying it actually love it mm. yeah Itself. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and final one from Lewis. It says, is there uh, any books you would recommend for the social engagement? Yes. So a couple of things. If you want to start quite um, generic, there's, Mark's already mentioned it. So Philippa Perry, 
Yeah, so she starts off. And then there's a book by um, Mona Della Hoop called Beyond Behaviours, and that then kind of bolts on to that, um, which then brings us to probably um, polyvagal theory. So it's uh, Stephen Porges' work. There is two books of this. There's the really scientific one that, unless you are a real <laughs> neuroscientist, I'd stay away from a little bit because it's very deep. I, I can't get me around it as much. Um, and there's a pocket one. Um, and that's where you can go. And if you just Google Stephen Porges, um, there's some there's some YouTube stuff as well on there. The other person I would look into who is very much about the adolescence brain, which can result from age of 10 up to, you know, near enough 30, is a lady called Sarah Blakemore. And she's wrote a book called Inventing Ourselves. Um, and then the other one that my top three books of, of all time at the minute is uh, Science of Parenting by Margot Sunderland that gives you all the neuroscience and the underpinning theory and she uses the polyvagal theory, but she does very much around from, from conception to um, kind of ages of five, six. Um, the one I've just said about polyvagal theory um, and then Inventing Ourselves by Sarah Blakemore is an amazing one. Um, and then the one about the boys, Michael Reichardt wants how to raise emotionally strong boys was fascinating. There's um there's also some podcast sales, I'm sure you're aware, but just for the for the coaches, there's a polyvagal podcast that I stumbled across as well. Um, Stephen Porges is on there, um, an interview for about an hour long, and there's lots of different ones. So if you want to upskill yourself in that area, I, I really recommend that. Um, yeah. Bit, a bit of light listening there. Um, Rich, any yeah, more? Matt's, Matt's just made me chuckle. He goes, this call has cost me 30 quid, just sold his free new book. <laughs> <laughs> You should be on It'll, some be worth it. It'll be worth it. If not, I'll give you money back. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, just before I hand it back to Mark to, to conclude, I just wanted to say prior to this, I thought Polly Vagel was, was a person. So I've learned <laughs> an awful lot my sounds have seen it. And as a parent of three young children, I'm certainly going to be looking into to some of those books and uh, studying up on it. So thank you, Sally. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. That's OK. Yeah, thank you, Sally. It just uh, remains for me. Well, actually, I've just got one question. Actually, it's just for the, the coaches that are on here. What would your um, advice be, or any 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 messages for the coaches that are on here, any aspiring um, academy coaches, coaches that want to follow a similar path to your path to yourself? Have you got um, any words of wisdom? Do you know what? I've had two mentees with me through work, through the projects at work we've had. And every time they've left me, I've given them a card and, and my, my, my bit in there to both of them. And I've got the I've got what I've got it printed in my kitchen is work hard and be kind to others. And I think mm. that's the biggest thing I could probably advise um, I could give people is is I'm very much about emotions and humans and feelings and behaviours and values and that's the way that my coaching is and how I try to be in life. So my major thing to anybody would be um, work hard and be kind to people. Mm. Oh, brilliant. Well, thank you, Sally. I look forward to uh, our next meeting, mine, yours and, and Simon's. Um, <laughs> I'm, learn I'm, le I'm learning a lot in those but um yeah, again thank you for your for your time and uh yeah, yeah well. again this has been recorded so hopefully we can get this out soon as well but um and also sally the the, the videos that you you've sent me i wondered if um you'd be okay with us sharing those for the box and yeah, website i can share it and then i've got the uh, powerpoint presentation that i normally use to deliver on which I delivered for the on the Advanced Youth Award or within the other within some of the pro clubs and other bits. So I can send you that as well, which ties into the um, to the to the videos. And if anybody wants to get in contact with me, my details will be on there, or Mark will give you my details. And welcome to contact me, and I'll discuss things and go through things because the more we can get polyvagal theory in a sense, but just of this these messages out there, um, the more then we can help to support. Um, children that are in our in our sessions and also give us a little bit of self-awareness as well which is vitally important so just please spread the message and feedback to me anything that you've tried or whatever and if you want any ideas for now before the kids come back then please just get in contact excellent thanks Sally. some great comments as well uh, finish up with 
Um, just quickly before we go, Paul Kia. I don't know if you know Paul. Sorry. I do know Paul. He says, thanks for a great session. Love everything I've learned from Sally. It completely changed my coaching methods and made a big impact on my team. So there you go. Oh, oh, I like that. Great. So, so yeah, thanks everyone. Thanks for joining. Look after yourselves and, and we'll see you uh, real soon. Thanks again, Sally. No problem. Thanks, guys. Thank you.